Okay, I think now is as good a time as ever to kick off our program for this morning. Uh, so good morning, everybody, and welcome to today, the Stratbase ADRI's virtual town hall discussion for today on digital readiness for banking frontliners. My name is Paco Pangalangan. I'm the executive director of Stratbase ADR Institute, and I'll be serving as your moderator for today's program. Um, to formally and to officially welcome everybody to today's event, may I please first introduce uh, Professor Dindo, uh, Victor Andres Dindo Manhit, the president of Stratbase ADR Institute, for his opening remarks for today's virtual panel discussion. Uh, Professor Manhit, good morning, sir. Good morning, Paco. Thank you. And good morning to our speakers. Very thankful and grateful for your acceptance to be part of our virtual town hall discussion on digital readiness for banking frontliners. I'd like also to thank our participants. We have hundreds of uh, registrants and hopefully they can join us uh, in a few minutes. You know, as we face the challenge of COVID, of this pandemic, In 2020, in the Institute, we started tracking what we call pandemic challenges. As we went through months, we started calling it, we need to live the COVID-19 virus and we need to overcome and turn these challenges into opportunity. I wanted to use this morning also to share a survey that we conducted nationally with our partner institution, the Social Weather Station, last October, when we tested this statement, the benefits of digital technology, such as strong cell phone signals, fast e-banking and social media, can help, can greatly help create jobs and businesses. And we see this result of 89% agreeing across geographic sector, across demographic. And what was key to the statement? Creating jobs. Because what we have noticed as we go into the election season, a key con the key concerns of Filipinos beyond this crisis is that there are economic challenges, job creation, job availability is always key. And when we followed it up further with this second question, that government should build, upgrade, and extensively expand the country's digital infrastructure to improve speed, reliability, and access to the internet. We see another 92%. Because this is critical. We have always challenged the private sector to do their part. But maybe as we go into the election season, as the next government also to do their part, how can you help build that infrastructure? Because at the end of the day, we have seen the growth of the digital economy. We have seen how the pandemic catalyzed the growth of the digital economy, how it has doubled in size and even introduced 12 million new digital consumers. We are one of the fastest growing digital economy in Southeast Asia. And that is what we need to see as an opportunity beyond this crisis. Businesses are increasingly using digital platforms to engage with consumers. And we believe we'll continue to do so. Majority of digital merchants are likely to increase their usage of digital financial services or digital tools. Digital platforms have made businesses more resilient to this pandemic. But of course, as we see this growth, we also see some challenges. It has added resilience, flexibility, and adaptability. But as we continue to track this, <clears throat> again with our survey partners, it is not without its challenge. That's why 
if you have noticed it, my earlier slide, we spoke of the digital divide or that equal access and use of digital tools and services as one of the pandemic challenges that we have been facing as we went into this pandemic in 2020. But beyond that also is digital skills. Paco, I hope I'm, you guys can hear me? We can hear you loud and clear, Bam. Thank you. Despite the growth of the digital economy, the Philippines still has a way to go in equipping Philippines with adequate digital skills. Critical to this are the schools, both public and private, at different levels from basic, secondary to tertiary, as we call it, K to 12 to the tertiary level. So while the pandemic wreaked havoc on our healthcare system, the growth of the digital economy through e-commerce, fintech, and digital banking has become the cure to many of our financial ailments. It has created a digital divide where many frontline workers have been left behind. But as frontline workers have gone digital, the lack of readiness for optimal and safe use of digital technology is something that we all need to deal with. We need to, the spirit of fostering a digital environment that empowers the whole of Philippine society rather than one that divides it. In Strat-based ADR Institute, I've always been proud to advocate of the need for collaboration between key stakeholders. We are proud of challenging policymakers, not to view it from the whole of government, but from the whole of society, because we need both public and private sector, the digital transformation can benefit the financial industry immensely. We must recognize that digital transformation must be accompanied by digital readiness. Again, good morning and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Professor Manhe. Thanks for uh, you know, setting the foundation for today's discussion and really illustrating the relevance of our discussion today and what's happening, what's been happening and what's happening around us and what will happen in the future. So thank you so much, Professor Manhe, for your opening remarks. Um, now, uh, before we move on to the rest of our program and, and to our first uh, panelist for, for this morning, uh, please allow me to uh, direct our participants to the Q&A function of, of Zoom. Uh, I encourage all of our participants, if they have any questions at any point, to just you know, input your questions in the Q&A and we'll get to them uh, later in the program, just so that everybody uh, understands the flow of, for this morning's uh, discussion. We'll first be hearing from, now that we've heard from Professor Manhit, uh, next we'll be hearing from a lot of the, the stakeholders, the different stakeholders that we invited to participate and, racially accept, and grace, gracefully accepted our invitation for this morning's uh, virtual discussion. And we have speakers from the banking sector, from of course, banking sector uh, from the regulatory side, from the BSP. We have from the Bankers Association of the Philippines. We have from the ICT sector, because this is another uh, you know, uh, aspect of the, this discussion that's important. We also have other speakers from, from the different banks like BPI, uh, RCBC. And of course, we have uh, here a panel reactor, uh, attorney JJ Vecini from the College of Law. After that, we're gonna to get to the open forum. Um, so just letting everybody know the flow of today's discussion. And now that I have, uh, I am you know, honored to introduce uh, our first panelist for, for this morning, uh, here to discuss assessing the digital readiness of the Philippine banking sector. Uh, we have Mr. Uh, Mel Plabasa, the director, uh, the head of the technology risk and innovation supervision Department of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, or BSP. Uh, Mr. Plabasan, Plabasan, good morning po. Hi, hi, good morning pa ako, and good morning to all, our, to all those who, I mean, to all the attendees, and of course, panelists as well. Thank you so much, Strat-based ADR Institute, for this opportunity to share our insights about this uh, very important topic. Now, let me, 
let me of course share my screen. I hope you can you can see my slide. We can see it, Pop. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's okay. Consistent with our uh, discussion team this morning, which is assessing the readiness, digital readiness for uh, banking frontliners. So I think uh, the readiness of our banks has become more crucial than, than ever, right? So at the backdrop of all of these surges, of all of these, uh, the effects of pandemic, I think uh, banks, I mean, are not uh, immune to the effects of, uh, of this pandemic, but they must continue to provide services to their clients because they need to have access to their funds. And aside from, of course, ready, uh, assessing the readiness of the banking frontliners, I think this begs the question of the regulator's readiness as well. So I would, uh, I would like to answer that particular question in the succeeding slides. Now, um, unlike natural, as, as mentioned by Dindo earlier uh, as part of his presentation, as, uh, I mean, uh, unlike natural disasters, um, but this pandemic is intrinsically more challenging because it's, very, it's really very difficult to determine the impact given the difference in scale and, uh, and duration. And really the, the reality is that the vulnerable groups are usually the most or the worst hit and norm and usually they are, they oftentimes can can hardly recover from from the pandemic and the on the good side on the silver lining of course we, this pandemic has also presented a lot of opportunities for digital transformation for building the capacity of our msmes for changing the behavior of our consumers the good thing is the banco central has already been laying the groundwork since i think um, for more than a decade now uh, uh, in the groundwork for this digital finance ecosystem that we are uh, enjoying right now. I've shown here, I'm, I've shown here some of the initiatives and reforms. I mean, um, from let's say easing the documentary requirements when it comes to opening accounts also that that will enable uh, financial institutions to onboard digitally. I mean, to do face-to-face -face, uh, KYC digitally. We have also, our initiative on NRPS has also given rise to, to the uh, two most widely used electronic fund transfer facilities, which are, of course, uh, and, uh, which are uh, Instapay and PesoNet. We have also streamlined uh, the licensing process for operators of payment system. And to ensure that, uh, I mean, there will be, I mean, to, in, to ensure, uh, uh, in terms of uh, revolutionizing merchant payments, we have also issued the national QR code uh, standard. And of course, uh, the topic of our discussion today, digital banking. Now, before I, I, I proceed with the digital banking uh, framework, I would like to highlight this particular initiative of the BSP. As you know, we have... Uh, we have been following, although on an ad hoc basis only, the test and learn or regulatory sandbox, which of course gave rise to the world famous Circular 649, our, our regulation on Imani, which has been used by as benchmark by other regulators as well, and which has also given rise, gave birth to, to the two of the largest Imani players in the country, used to be Gcash and Smart Money, and now uh, Paymaya. So, Right now, uh, I'm just, I would just like to promote that we are, of course, uh, formalizing our test and learn framework or the regulatory uh, sandbox. So we would like to institutionalize, we would like to institutionalize this approach by, of course, establishing the, the guidelines, especially aimed at setting formal structure when it comes to piloting uh, new solutions, especially now that, that, emerging mark, that, that emerging markets and, and fintech players are starting to mature and scale up. Of course, this particular policy initiative covers the core design elements of the, the test and learn uh, framework 
uh, that we have always been used to. And of course, we have also uh, incorporated the standards and practices adopted by uh, advanced jurisdictions. So if you are if you want to access the, the, the this particular circular that this is for exposure and it's available in our website uh, we would entertain comment suggestion until february 28 now moving to the the, the, the topic on digital banking uh, framework this is which is also a product of the bsp's uh, proactive stance when it comes to harnessing and enabling regulatory environments because we consider digital banks as our as new partners when it comes to addressing barriers in, in uh, to financial inclusion and at the same time we see them as partners when it comes to onboarding more Filipinos to our formal financial ecosystem so right now digital bank is a separate and distinct category of so we of banks so we have universal commercial thrift rural bank and now uh, uh, digital bank. And because of their digital centric uh, business model, we, we fully understand that their operations should be underpinned by, by strong digital governance, by robust, uh, resilient, secure digital infrastructure, and of course, effective data management strategy and practices. That's why these new types of institutions are also subject to the same regulations that we impose on existing players, uh, particularly regulations on, uh, on uh, risk management, cybersecurity, uh, money laundering, consumer protection. Um, and so far after the issuance of the, the circular on digital bank, we have so far licensed six digital banks, two of which are uh, just converted their thrift and rural banking license. They are already operational right now. Uh, and good thing that these two institutions have, were, were already able to onboard close to 300,000 new clients and were able to generate, I think, close to 6 billion deposits already. And uh, moving forward, again, that the other four players are expected to commercially launch this year. I think Maya Bank is expected to launch within, within March. Union Digital by, 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 I think, by second quarter of this year. And GoTime and Union Bank are also expected to launch their products and services within the year. Now, uh, another initiative, of course, that, uh, that's keeping the BSP busy right now, of course, is our initiative on open finance. So it used to be open banking. So we expanded the scope to open finance, and hopefully it will be expanded further to include open data. So having recognized that, of course, financial inclusion can be best achieved through digital transformation, we have always been supportive of, of measures that, that will address uh, uh, gaps, gaps when it comes to providing financial products and services to Filipinos. So that's why we have issued the circular on open finance framework, which basically um, maps, maps out new means of uh, innovative financial services delivery, of course, uh, by empowering consumers, by giving them better access to their customer data, to their data, both financial and uh, personal information, so that they would have uh, access to services that are, of course, responsive to their their needs right so it extends it's not just banking products and services it also covers other financial products and services like of course investment uh, loans um what else insurance um, so it this will largely leverage on the use of open api when it comes to financial uh, intermediation now to just a so high level graphical representation of the open finance uh, framework. Again, as you can see here, this demonstrates our eagerness and uh, support to, to, to have an inclusive financial ecosystem that goes beyond banking products. I mentioned that, that it covers uh, other financial products as well, and it's leveraged, it's anchored really on on consent-driven data portability, interoperability, interoperability, and strategic partnerships among existing players, uh, new players, uh, fintech players, uh, including third-party service providers. 
And then the, the, the journey towards open finance, it's not just solely for the BSP. It's actually a shared undertaking or a shared responsibility with, with the entire financial services industry. And uh, towards this end, we, I mean, in terms of the governance structure, we have moved to, to, to create a structure that is largely led by the, by the players themselves. As you can see here, the, the, the initial uh, Open Finance Oversight Committee transition group is composed of uh, members from different bank categories, uh, from EMI others, from, from operators of payment system, from the fintech community, so that the interests of, of all the players are taken into account when it comes to policy making, when it comes to decision, prioritization of the use cases. Um, this particular transition group is, uh, is basically tasked uh, to, to, to craft the initial policies and standards uh, and basically uh, governing and supporting the pilot implementation of the identified use cases. So we, we have initially identified direct, direct debit, KYC, and statement aggregation as the use cases that will be piloted within the next few months. So to end this presentation, again, um, I, I have shown here some of the policy see reforms and uh, initiatives that, that the BSP is working on together with the different players, together with the industry. And I think the common denominator here is that uh, the BSP as, as the overseer and as the regulator is really committed to establish a, a policy and regulatory environment. Of course, that will enable innovations to flourish, while at the same time ensuring, of course, that adequate uh, measures, adequate controls, and, uh, and safeguards will be really an, in place to manage risk and, of course, to, to ensure that we are able to protect, I mean, to, to, to maintain financial stability. So as, 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 and so this brings me back to my earlier question, because obviously the new players are quite ready. The, the, that the existing players, most of them are, are, are ready as well. So my, and, and I believe the question is, is the regulator ready? So my, my answer to that question, I believe is quite obvious based on the number of the initiatives that we are working on right now. However, to us being ready is, is not, uh, particularly in this digital universe, is, is not just, a, it, it shouldn't be viewed as, as a single in, uh, as a single point in time um, perspective, right? So, so given that technological innovations move quickly, then we must always be uh, we must we must always be on our toes. Let's say, to ensure that we keep in step to staying light and nimble, so that we will be able to fulfill our our mandates. And really, these are exciting times ahead, and we each have a role to to play. So let us continue to to think of ways to work together while of course pursuing our, because we, we each have our own respective goals, which are all intended to truly really provide better ways of serving our country, especially the unbanked, the underserved and underprivileged. That ends my presentation. Maraming salamat po. Back to you, Paco. Thank you, Mr. Klobasan. Uh, yeah, a great presentation again, sir. Uh, oh, it, the last time you did this, this is this. We actually, if you recall, we did this almost exactly one year ago when we had a, a similar discussion. Uh, and again, I, I again impressed and inspired by the you know the innovation of the VSP and its openness to collaborate for for this ever evolving to you know to conquer this ever evolving challenge of digital readiness for for the banking sector. So thank you, thank you, sir. If if you can hang around, we'll have some questions later. Bob, I'm sorry. Okay, po. Um, so uh, for our next speaker, we'll be hearing uh, from Mr. Uh, Wick Veloso, uh, who's the president and chairman of the Banks Association of the Philippines, or BAP. Uh, he is also the president and CEO of the Philippine National Bank, and he'll be uh, sharing with us his, his uh, message on key lessons in the digital shift. Um, Speaking, of course, from, from the Banking Association of the Philippines perspective. So this is, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Wick Willard. 
Mr. Melchor Plabasan, Mr. Xichi Gopal, Attorney J.J. Ducini, Mr. John Carrie Ong, Mr. Noel Santiago, Mr. Lito Villanueva, Professor Dindo Manhid, and Mr. Francesco Pangalangan. To everyone watching us today, good morning. There is a saying attributed to English naturalist Charles Darwin, the man behind the theory of evolution. It is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that is the most adaptable to change. For the past 10, 20 years, we have seen significant changes in our lives, due in large part to the rapid technological advancements around the world. And one of the biggest changes being the way we bank. Today, banks offer mobile banking services, allowing us to provide services to our customers at the comfort of their own homes. If I were to travel back in time and tell my colleagues about this technological innovation, they would not believe our innovations today, such as that authorization and verification of identities for the bank transfers can be done even without seeing our customers in person or that new accounts can be created virtually anywhere through a mobile device. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, we have expanded the range of digital services available to the public since consumers opted to use online and mobile banking services out of necessity as digital payments and physical distancing became the norm. The sudden onset of the pandemic imposed a challenge to the banking industry but we took it as an opportunity as well to innovate and provide better services for the Filipinos. In this time of crisis, we know that we have to be flexible and be responsive to change. Likewise, to help steer our economy towards healing and recovery, we have to establish a safe, efficient, and reliable digital financial ecosystem. You see, the journey towards securing a digital financial ecosystem is not without difficulty and effort. It was coupled with challenges, disruptions, and upheavals, trial and error. But as they say, there's no such thing as wasted effort. It only becomes wasted if you don't learn anything from it. Now, allow me to share with you the lessons we have learned from the past few decades of navigating technology and banking. What have the banks learned in the digital shift? First, technology is a means to reach customers who find difficulty in logistics. Technology is available for banks to utilize and encourage more financial transactions and ease customers of the burden of having to physically travel. In the recent report of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, the number of Filipinos with access to banks and electronic money channels climbed to 41 million as of the third quarter of 2021. There is a reason to believe that online banking made it easier for Filipinos to access banking services in the country and that they are continuously adapting to the use of technology for their financial transactions, which is good news. The Bankers Association of the Philippines will continue to support banks to sustain this development. 
as promoting financial inclusion unlocks more opportunities for Filipinos and help them improve their financial well-being. Second, as technology provides connectivity between banks and customers, it can also make us both vulnerable to cybercrime. As more Filipinos shift to online and mobile banking, we face another major roadblock, cybercrimes. Cybercrimes remain to be one of the pressing issues faced by the industry. Cybercrimes affect each and every one of us. These fraudulent schemes disrupt individuals and the daily operations of financial institutions such as banks, even government agencies. When the pandemic started, the number of reported phishing incidents started to dramatically increase. The National Bureau of Investigation in 2020 reported that there was a 200% increase in these incidents since the lockdown started. Any fan of the film Ocean's Eleven or the Netflix series Money Heist would know that thieves would do anything for money and that we should always be one step ahead in securing our customers' financials. This leads us to the third lesson. The government is a partner in protecting people against the new and developing forms of crime. An addendum to this is that stakeholders must also work together with us. The bank should instill mindfulness and consciousness over one's financial transactions and activities online. One of the initiatives of the BAP to address cyber crimes is to strengthen our CyberSafe campaign. It's our information drive that supplements BP member banks' efforts to stop cybercrime by sharing cybersecurity reminders to the public regularly. We are partnering with various stakeholders, such as social media influencers, government agencies, and the media to promote cybersecurity awareness throughout the Philippines. On top of this, the BAP member banks continue to invest to enhance its security systems and make sure that its technologies are up to date to prevent and combat cyber attacks. In line with the objectives of the BSP's Digital Payments Transformation Roadmap, we will continue to boost digital payments in the country and ensure that more people will get to participate in the growing digital economy in the country. That said, we aim to take advantage of the emerging technologies in the Philippines to bring various kinds of financial services to every Filipino and help them be prepared as we fully embrace digital transformation. Much work has to be done, but we are optimistic that we are all well positioned to welcome every form of change and innovation brought by the digital economy. Let me circle back to Charles Darwin to close this brief speech. It is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that is the most adaptable to change. To be the most adaptable to change, that has always been our goal in the Philippine banking industry. Not only survive, but to thrive, in this crisis, allowing all other affected 
and vulnerable industries to recover and bounce back as we safely reopen the economy post COVID and face the new challenges ahead. Maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. So thank you, Mr. Rick Veloso, for your, for your insights on you know, key lessons in the digital shift, uh, especially from the perspective of the of the uh, Bankers Association of the Philippines. Uh, next up, uh, we have our next speaker is here from the from the uh, from the digital side of the discussion to share their insights on, on this topic that we have today, which is uh, digital readiness for banking frontliners. Um, our next speaker is Mr. KG Gopal, who is the modern work and security sales leader um, for Microsoft. Uh, and having worked in the tech industry for over a decade, he started his career in the front lines as an engineer on a factory shop floor before becoming a leader in driving digital transformation across a variety of organizations. Uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Gopal? Good yes, hi. Morning. Hi. Hi. Morning. Glad to have you. The floor Thank is yours. You. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Professor Manet, uh, Mr. Paco, Mr. Plabasan, all of you who've spoken so far. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with the Stratbase ADR Institute today. A wonderful event, really talking about something super topical and uh, interesting to hear, Paco, that this is almost like the second time you're doing this. Um, you did this about a year ago in a slightly different forum. So. Let me just share my screen quickly and we'll get going. All right, so uh, I'm here today to talk about empowering the frontline banking worker. You know, we, we've heard from, you know, three speakers so far about various aspects about, you know, making sure that we can all adapt to working in basically the future, right? COVID has accelerated uh, everything that we've been trying to achieve for the last decade or so on digital transformation. And I think one of the key industries where this has been felt more than most is BFSI, right? Um, and it's largely because we get to a stage where it's a very personal uh, aspect that, uh, you know, we deal with humans and uh, making sure that everyone of our customers has a good and futuristic experience is pretty critical. And a central element to that, apart from a lot of the things that we heard a little bit earlier, Mr. Plavasan was talking about uh, the structure and the regulatory uh, aspect of it, is to make sure that our employees are empowered and no more critical than the people at the front line. So my name is Shritaj Gopal. Uh, I lead our modern workplace and security businesses across Asia Pacific for our mid-market segment. Um, you can call me KG. Um, my LinkedIn is there on, on the page in case you'd like to connect later. Um, but uh, uh, let me get going. I think one of the one of the critical things that what what we've learned is, and every country is going through this at a different stage, right? Financial services are absolutely moving digital first. Two years have have accelerated a decade worth of digital transformation. But what's interesting to see is that the countries that are opening up right now, a lot of them in Western Europe, in the United States, even in the Middle East, we're seeing that the, the, the pent up demand for that human interaction is absolutely coming back. And so financial services are absolutely moving digital first, but branches are far from obsolete. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means in everybody's context. But if you look at some of the statistics from 2021, uh, particularly, let's say, in the United States, one of the first few countries to, to accelerate the vaccination phase and then move into an open world, 50% of adults who had a banking account actually visited a physical branch at least once, which is very interesting because you would think that, you know, there would be a lot more concern about going out and interacting. But we've seen that when done safely and in the contract of, you know, healthcare regulations and guidance, this is actually coming back. And so we need to make sure that in the future, as we think about this, there's a lot of things that we keep in mind as we go into a hybrid world for the future, right? And the experience that we give to our customers, both in the branch and virtually, need to be at battle. And so how do we make sure that we do that? And is, is banking really picking up in the digital stage? Well, the first statistic that you can see here is that one third of our customers are actually using more digital channels than ever before, right? And that's a huge spike for any new method of financial transactions. And it's showing record growth. And we're seeing that even in the first sort of two and a half months of 2022. So change is here. We are evolving in this industry and we want to make sure that we continue to advance that stage, particularly from an experience perspective. 
what does that really mean, right? And we talked a little bit about frontline people, the people who are the driving force behind any progress that we make. And this is not just a banking statement, it cuts across every industry. All of you working for organizations know this in your hearts that if we're not going to be able to drive our people to make sure that you know they're successful, the organizations aren't successful. And so there are three broad aspects that we think about when we talk about people and how we empower them for the future. The first is, what is the future of work for every single one of us? How do we work? Today, I happen to be in the office alone by myself in a room. Um, but with the moment I step out of this room and onto the floor, I know there's, there's social distancing regulations, there's a mask, but I am you know, pleasantly you know, pleased by the fact that I am you know, into the office, which is, which is a nice change for what I've been doing for the last majority of the last two years. And so what does that future work look like? How do we make sure that everybody is empowered to deliver on what the organizations need to deliver in the most productive manner possible? The second is talking about secured access to data and, and devices. Uh, particularly in the banking industry, we need to make sure that security is top of mind and paramount. And, and the reason we do that, and Mr. Blabasan briefly touched upon it with a you know, few lovely Netflix shows examples, but it was great to see that you know this is now top of mind for everybody, from regulators to associations to, of course, end customers, and of course, the banks that are in the center of this. And so making sure that that escalates into the frontline scenario as well is very critical because sometimes we think about protecting infrastructure, we talk about protecting executives, but we forget about the frontline workers. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. And the last thing is to make sure that they're productive, right? Because what we don't want to do is to make sure that despite putting all these rules and regulations into place, that we are hampering productivity in any shape or form, because we've realized that that's probably going to be critical going forward. Uh, we're not probably going to go back to a pre-COVID world entirely, and we need to make sure that we can manage that across the board. So what are what are customers expecting? And, and so the work that we've done obviously across the world with banking, financial sector and insurance customers is showing that A, customers are expecting a lot more from their frontline interactions. Um, not just because of the societal pressures of being living in a COVID world, the stresses and strains that it can cause for people who are living and working at home, who are working at home and living at home at the same time, multi-generation families. Customers really expect things to happen fast, efficiently and pleasantly. And so this is true in person and digitally, right? And that's a very important distinction to make sure that we understand, which is how do you have a good frontline interaction digitally? Because that's not always top of mind when we think about how we deal with banks. And so there are four things that we've decided, we've learned from our customers and as we've helped them go through this transformation, which are A, people expecting fast and efficient transactions because we need to make sure that the core jobs that they're coming to do or get done, get done quickly and efficiently. Two, personalized experiences, and we're all moving towards a world where we are getting to the stage more and more, and we're trying to get to hyper-local, hyper-personalized experiences for customers across the board. Three, consistent experience across all touch points, and I briefly, I briefly talked about this already. And then finally, that it's secure, and they can continue to have a conversation with their bank, no matter which way they want to, and make sure with the confidence that that is a secure transaction that they can rely on. And so we need to make sure that that factors in not just when they feel like they have to go to a bank but also obviously digital so one of the things that we've also realized at the same time is that there are some challenges right and we've, we're constantly evolving to get to a stage where we want to make sure that we are helping our customers address those challenges and so the first is that there's turnover and a lot of you who are involved in, the, in banking organizations, who have call centers, who have support centers, who have both onshore and offshore support centers, and of course, who are helping run support centers and call centers for the rest of the globe are seeing that there's a high turnover. And so how do we make sure that the, you know, we're giving the best possible experience to our employees uh, to try and make sure that they have a pleasant experience to try and limit that high turnover in call centers and of course you know at the banking staff at I, everything from a teller window to, to bank to branch managers second is that these manual and menial tasks that we were you know you so used to reams of paper that you know we were also used to as a natural uh, byproduct of you know being in the banking financial sector or in healthcare by the way um, we they limit employee productivity and so we're seeing that that has a direct impact on employee success the third is, of course, the, the friction between the need for personalization and, the, and speed and efficiency, because it's not always easy to balance those. And I know a lot of you are, are focused on trying to make sure that you reduce that friction so that we can continue to, to be more productive. 
And then finally, the fact that employees are feeling disconnected. And while a lot of work must have been done in the last two years at all your organizations about trying to drive some sort of connected method because we had to, because we were all working from home. Um, the reality is that to be to just give access to a collaboration tool does not mean that the employees feel connected because the cultural aspects of all organizations can't transmit through just one collaboration tool, whatever it is, right? And so we need to make sure that we're creating an, an environment where the cultural aspects are also transferred in this hybrid remote work scenario. So those are some of the challenges we have. And so how are we trying to address it? Well, the primary address that we have realized that customers are looking at making sure that they solve first and foremost and primary at the top of minds of CISOs, CTO, CTOs and CIOs across the organization and consequently CEOs as well is security and compliance. Because one of the biggest fears is that cyber attacks, which are now commonplace, unfortunately commonplace, um, need to be protected against. And so this we've seen at Microsoft that there's an over 200% increase in cyber attacks just in the period of February to April 2020. And you would recall back now, I know it's two years ago, but you would recall that period is sort of the first wave of COVID when countries started locking down in that period. Um, and we really saw an increase there. And obviously we've seen the evolution since then. A lot of organizations have moved into a security first mode, but how has that hampered productivity and the balance which we talked about on the previous slide. And then the last is all, over half the banks are moving to a data-led approach for compliance. And this is super critical. And we heard about this in the previous, in, in, um, in uh, Mr. Plabasan's session as well, which is how do we make sure that there's an organization uh, that is helping at the regulatory level to make sure that compliance is viewed in the view of the future, right? It was easy to say, you need to check 500 boxes in 20 pages of paper to make sure that there's this verification done before you can take X, Y, Z actions. But how do we make sure that we are being able to transfer that in the future world? So at the regulatory level, at the policy level, as well as the organization, the FSI level, this is moving towards a data-led approach. And it's great to see because big data is one of those areas which has a lot of potential that can be untapped and mined. And so something for all of you to look at and think about as well. So what are the two big aspects of, of security and compliance? And I'll just touch upon this briefly. Um, but the first is, of course, anticipate and protect with data against being compromised, right? These are around threats and the attack surfaces, of course, increase dramatically. Every time you increase a, a, a tool, a remote working tool, a, a core banking tool, or a ERP CRM system, as it keeps evolving and your landscape keeps increasing, the attack surface keeps increasing. And so making sure that we continue to protect that ever expanding attack surface is important in a very anticipatory manner. And that, that really means a change in thinking, right? Because we're trying to see and advise organizations at Microsoft over the last few years that we need to move to what we call a zero trust model, right? Which is you don't trust any access until and unless it is verified and you do not allow access for anything more than what is absolutely needed. And making sure that that can happen in a seamless manner goes a long way in helping protect security. The second is of course, information being shared with the right people at the right time for the right job and that's it, right? So gone are the days where we advise customers that one size fits all in terms of access. Now in this environment, with the environment that we're living in in the remote working world, we need to make sure that information needs to be protected and regulated and guarded, but at the same time, try to be made frictionless when it needs to be accessed. And again, it goes back to that concept of zero trust. And then the last aspect is about, you know, making sure that conflicts of interest are, are removed and making sure that the, the people who need to do the work at the right time are able to do that work and have the tools and abilities to be able to do that work in a secure and compliant manner. The second part of this is the, the regulatory aspect. And when we're painfully aware at Microsoft that, you know, we need to work hand in hand with our customers like banking and financial institutions like yourselves and the regulators at the same time. And we do a lot of work at the governmental policy level across all countries, including the Philippines, um, to make sure that we are helping working with the BSPs to, to, to empower banks to, to go forward. And there's been great work done in the Philippines to make sure that the regulators is encouraging this move towards the digital transformation. And some of the examples that we saw around the new age digital banks, and six of them I saw that got approved in the last sort of you know, two year period, which is great to see. Um, and so the first aspect is you know, uh, simplifying data retention. And data retention is one of those things that you know we we just assume that would be would stay forever. You know, a lot of most countries have five to ten year data retention policies 
in the event of any eventuality. And we need to make sure that we continue to evolve those. But how do we do that as in a futuristic manner? Because we need to make sure that there's some sort of a standardization going forward. The second is we need to protect high value information. And again, this goes back into the concept of auditing and how do we make sure that management records are updated in a manner that is searchable in a quick and efficient manner. And again, we're moving in a world where records from four years ago that might be on a piece of paper sitting in a branch somewhere, which may not be accessible today, needs to be accessed in six months time. And what do you do in that scenario? And so if you think back to 2020 and the first six months, that's what happened in many cases. And so this model of how do we move to a digital compliance model is evolving rapidly. And so we're happy to help, of course, any organization that, that go through that. And we work with some of the largest BFSI customers in the world to move towards that model. And we're seeing a lot of traction there. And then the last is AI. And you know, AI is now prevalent. We, we at Microsoft infuse it in a lot of our own products. We use it ourselves as, you know, we, we call this dog fooding. Um, but at the same time, we want to make sure that our customers understand that AI can be a buzzword or it can be a tool, right? We want to make sure that you strike the balance that you are comfortable with. There are some things that, you know, large-scale technology companies like Microsoft can do by infusing AI into tools and then it becomes a very simplistic decision. But at the same time, we want to encourage this notion of build your own and how do we make sure that we give you the platform to do what you're comfortable with doing. And so when you apply that concept of AI to compliance logs, audits, then I think you get to a stage where you're basically living in the future along with working with the regulators. And so we want to make sure that we keep that top of mind. So those are really critical aspects. If you put all of this in the context of frontline, how do we make sure that we empower? So I've got three examples to share with you where we have helped customers again in the last two years, uh, primarily, but you know we've been working with these customers for a while, one in Canada, one in Kenya, and one in the United States. And so I won't go through all of them, but you know, Connect First Credit Union, a Canadian company, we helped build an entire Microsoft 365 led journey from the front line to the CEO, where you have this world of connected in the future and building an employee internet to make sure that no matter where you're working, whether it's in the branch, in the back office, in the front office, or at home, that, that entire purview of the cultural transformation and the employee experience is seamless. Uh, Fannie Mae, uh, a fairly large US mortgage lender as well. Uh, one of the things that they wanted to do, again, accelerated by COVID, was the manual transaction component of what their frontline staff were willing to, uh, were needing to do. And so leveraging some of the tools that, that they had uh, and some of the things that we helped them with, they were actually able to automate and digitize the manual processes that were there in the realm of the productivity that their employees were already used to doing. And so a slightly different tangent to how we think about remote working, because remember, if you have to fill a new, new banking customer uh, form, you want to make sure that that's done in the most seamless manner possible, rather than making sure that you know they have to go to the branch, they have to sign a piece of paper, et cetera. And how do you really automate that at the frontline level? And then finally, um, Corporate Bank of Kenya um, was, you know, this is one of the other organizations that had, which would rely on, on email quite heavily. And so uh, it was very difficult for them to work on premise uh, IT hardware and servers that, you know, they were not able to access frontline staff that were suddenly stuck at home and it, uh, an environment that basically promoted and accelerated their need to move to the cloud and digital transformation and how they adopted this entire suite to make sure that their frontline workers were able to serve their customers uh, as seamlessly as possible. And so really, I think uh, I have last, the last two slides to wrap up. The, the reality is that the future of all our financial services, me as a customer, you as a bank, the regulators, the governments, all of us depend on investing in frontline workers with security and compliance as top of mind, but making sure that the employee experience and, and the friction that they, we need on productivity does not get hampered. And so really, as you think about this, as leaders of your organizations, I leave you with one last message. When you think about frontline workers, the mantra that I ask you to think about is secure digital inclusion. And this is, this is a phrase that we've, I've coined to try and make sure that I, I, I land this message to make sure that not only are we thinking about this in a very simplistic manner, so it's a three word mantra, but it tries to incorporate all of the things that we've talked about. Security, top of mind, and making sure that we think about frontline workers like, me, like making sure that they have access to the most sensitive data that your organization has. Gone are the days 
where the CEO and the board of management at the very top were the ones who were deigned to have the most sensitive access. Today, a frontline worker who has access to your customer's banking and transaction records is deigned to have that most sensitive data, particularly when they are outside the traditional perimeter of what you do. So making sure that that's secure is critical. The second is self-explanatory, but you know we, we need to make sure that we think about inclusion in a digital way um, to make sure that it's not just a function of here's your ID card, you can enter this building. It's about how do we make sure that they can do it from their couch. And then the last part is about inclusion. And this is a topic that I'm passionate about in my life as well. But you know, for a long time, and Paco introduced me as a, as a frontline worker. I, I started my career on shop floor in a factory decades ago, you know, working with my hands, making, you know, uh, hardcore equipment, making in a shop floor with hot presses and cold press, et cetera. As a frontline worker at heart, there were many things that were meant to be only for office white collar management workers. And so when we think about inclusion in this digital world, ensuring that the frontline workers are a part of the conversation is a, is a wonderful thing in itself. And so I would encourage all of you at your organizations to try and adopt this mantra as you think about frontline workers and empowering them for the future. So that's it from me. I hope you've enjoyed this, this small topic. I'm of course here for the Q&A and I look forward to the, to the rest of the sessions. Back to you, Paco. Uh, thanks so much, Casey. That was really interesting. Really insightful stuff, uh, and, and it's nice, and, and it's good that it was because you're actually the only speaker we have from the technology sector. So I think you really, uh, you know, held up the flag for for, the, for your sector, and it was very, very insightful. So thank you so much for that. Um, okay, uh, so next we actually have a panel of reactors. Um, of course, you know we're we're quite. In terms of structure, we allow our, our panelists to share whatever they want to do, really. Um, so you can react or you can share some of your own insights as well from your own experiences. Uh, uh, the first uh, panel reactor we have is Mr. Noel Santiago, who's the Chief Digital Officer of the Bank of the Philippine Islands, or BPI. As a market leader, he communicates the digital vision and strategy to all stakeholders across BPI. Uh, Mr. Santiago, good good morning, Paul, sir. Yeah, good morning, Paco, and good morning to everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, as a reaction to um, all the previous speakers, um, it just demonstrate the, the complexity and the magnitude that we are struggling with right now. Uh, the rapid changes that uh, the pandemic has given us uh, is forcing us to accelerate the plans that we ourselves were putting up uh, five years ago. You know, some are even more than that, right? Our transformation, our technology roadmaps uh, was given a, a strong kick at the butt during the pandemic. Fortunately, we started with the foundation quite early and uh, it allowed us to respond quicker than uh, later. Uh, what is more crucial to us right now is beyond the technology is, is the culture and um, the people side of things. Uh, the biggest challenge that we're grappling is now is our client adoption of the digital, um, the digitalization of the economy is faster than our own um, uh, labor force in dealing with them. Um, we are an organization that has been in the country for the longest period of time, 170 years. And, and we have a lot of our, our staff who stayed with us longer. So they are really, really well, um, well entrenched and, and well versed in, in the face-to-face -face dealing. They, they, they do the client dialogue day in, day out. Uh, the trust of the client is not just on the organization, but also the people that they know. So the moment you bring that and break it apart uh, and put a barrier of uh, the technology, the sense of being intimate and personalization is becoming or has become a, a barrier from both sides. No? 
uh, they especially if they got used to it and and a lot of our uh, if i may say senior citizens are the one that's struggling the most and we have a senior citizen on the other side and we have not so young people senior officers on the other side and you bring them together and uh, they've been dealing with the face-to-face -face engagement for uh, all their life and then we put a barrier now in the middle there seems to be a sense of apprehension right um we have taken as a, a kg uh, later uh, earlier showed us uh, we're also a client of theirs that have taken the technology that they provide and we started equipping our people our staff and our uh, the organization uh digitally uh, so we use the the solutions that they offer to create collaboration now uh, sharing of uh, documents no we can now we can now create um, discussion papers we can now create presentation materials in a more collaborative online uh, editing and so on through the technology that they provide. So we're happy with that. And uh, we're slowly building this and developing this capability. Now, what we are doing right now, if I want to summarize, if I may summarize that, uh, we are putting our our action plan around uh, a five R you know, uh, or the five R E. We are retooling our infrastructure, our technology infrastructure. We are reskilling our people um, and also the cultures change. We are re-engineering the processes, uh, the processes that would be more suited to a more digital engagement. We are re-engaging our clients in a digital front. And as we use all of this, the, the, the four REs, uh, we are reimagining the customer experience and the journey. So we are anchoring on, on our activities along that line. And um, slowly we are we're getting, uh, we're getting there, right? We're taking one step at a time uh, hand-holding both our, our, our clients and also our own people. So that's where we are today. So that's what I can share right now. Thanks, Mr. Shanshak. That was really interesting, Bono, especially the point that you raised about that barrier uh, of trust that, that your customers have, not only in the, in the institution, uh, but also in the people that they deal with on a day-to-day -day yeah. basis. Um, if I may add to that, we, we spoke to our client and uh, we told them, why is there still certain apprehension? Uh, why do you think there are apprehension if, if we can engage you digitally? You can see the same face. You can see the same um, in a video. It's almost like a, a, a live, right? It's a live a dialogue, except there's no touch what makes them feel different um we got the, the very good response no uh, especially those those people who just venturing into the financial services the first time they said if i walk into a branch i see a a brick and mortar i see a logo outside and when i go inside and i see people in the uniform i know i can talk to them and I know they're legit, they're official, they are, I can talk to them and they're not gonna be uh, cheated, you know, for whatever reason. So there's a sense of security. Now, you take that away and you, you, created, you create a new way of engaging it digitally. While you can make the dialogue and, and the background of the person that they're talking to, like an official, uh, an official office with, with the logos and so on. Their sense of confidence and security, he says, it's still not there. I right? say it's not there. I know if I did something today in the branch and something goes wrong, I can go back to this branch tomorrow, 
right? And bang the table and demand resolution. Right? So this is the kind of feedback that we're getting. And it's, yeah, uh, uh, we are providing the same response and so on and so forth. But say, yeah, but when you're in, in, an, in an emotional stage, you want to, to have a physical, right? So uh, in, in one of the presentation early, uh, we, we strongly believe that the branch will never go away, right? It will be there, uh, but it will serve uh, uh, a different purpose or a more, more complex purpose than what they are doing now. That's interesting, Paul. That's really interesting. Uh, yeah, because we've been discussing, and I am sure we'll talk about this more later in the open forum, Paul. But I think uh, it's really interesting how you highlight technology. We've been discussing it as as a tool, as a, as a solution. Um, but here it's also a barrier in some cases because of this so social and cultural aspects that, that you raised. So thank you so much, uh, Mr. Santiago. I, I hope that we can discuss this more uh, during the open forum. Um, moving on to our next speaker. Uh, next, we have uh, Mr. Lito Villanueva. Mr. Lito Villanueva is the Executive Vice President and Chief Innovation and Inclusion Officer for RCBC. He is concurrently the Chief Digital Transformation Advisor for the Yuchenko Group of Companies. Um, and he also founded a FinTech called Alliance PH. Um, Mr. Villanueva, good morning, sir. Uh, good um, morning, Paco. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you for having me this morning. Of course, uh, nice to see Noel, of course, Director Mel, uh, Attorney JJ, uh, Dindo, and of course, uh, earlier, KG, and of course, uh, through week, no? Uh, through a video message. So if I may be allowed to share my screen. And Jay, thank you. Again, good morning to everyone. Uh, I am here to you know, at least share with you the experience of RCBC, you know, uh, given this uh, topic for this morning. So innovation with empathy, uh, and this has been RCBC's uh, guiding principle in its efforts to push digital acceleration and financial inclusion forward. We in RCBC believe that when it comes to digital finance, uh, the customer journey and experience must always be at the core. Based on our projections, 50 to 60% of branch-based over-the-counter transactions have disappeared because of the pandemic and shifted to digital. So we have banks who want to offer financial products and services but cannot depend on branch banking alone because of health protocols. Then we have customers wanting or needing to get transactions done through banks but are limited because mobility restrictions prevent them from visiting bank branches. So how then did we make things work? So in trying to find solutions to make banking services more accessible through contactless, uh, you know, contactless uh, solutions, what we did thus far is, you know, uh, to come up with ways on how we can provide uh, banking services to our clients. So, uh, so we in trying to find solutions to make banking services more accessible through contactless transactions, financial institutions have broken the barriers to financial inclusion. So the pandemic pushed us to find creative solutions to facilitate life-saving transactions at a time when access to digital is critical to survival. And so finally, we have reconciled the two. Digital transformation drives financial inclusion and financial inclusion in turn fuels digital transformation. This has immensely uh, helped cope with and survive and even thrive during the pandemic. For more than a year, I have been speaking about how people should prepare for the new global order. I call it the emergence of a digital first society. Let me illustrate what digital first society means for digital financial services. Here's where we are now. Majority of the financial transactions have migrated to digital. According to the BSP, the use of e-payments in the country has spiked to more than 5,000% in 2020 alone. This has been enabled by PSP's own digital payments transformation roadmap, which envisions a cash-like Philippines where 50% of the transactions are converted into digital and 70% of Filipino adults onboarded into the formal financial system. This is an industry-wide effort as well, with banks like RCBC closely aligning their goals with, with that of the PSP. So all factors considered, this seems to be working. 
In recent study by a UK-based moneytransfers.com, one out of two Filipinos or 52% of Filipinos surveyed said they are in favor of a shift to a cash-like society in the coming years. This makes sense because aside from the current ease of transaction that we are experiencing, proves to be helpful even in the years following the pandemic. Digital transactions mean faster payments, which results in faster distribution of cash and in turn, faster wealth building. But we need to continue innovating in order to keep the momentum. So despite this, uh, despite this no, a lot of work has to be done in order to turn this into reality. The next great disruption is just around the corner. And we don't want another digital tsunami catalyzing the innovations that we come up with. Why wait when we can create what's next? RCBC is one of the leading legacy banks in the Philippines that has a long tradition of providing excellent financial services to Filipinos. But at the same time, we have not been afraid in challenging the norm when it comes to our digital initiatives. Pivot is key to stay relevant. So RCBC has also taken the lead in supporting the BSP's digital transformation efforts with the rollout of three innovative digital platforms, namely RCBC Digital, ATM Go, and Discartec. These digital finance innovations target to address the needs of Filipinos across socioeconomic spectrum through our contextual banking strategy. For RCBC, it is important that we provide our clients and users with hyper-personalized services and products that directly remedy existing pain points and meet customer demands. Hence, we have enhanced the existing RCBC online and mobile banking app with the most advanced features for the more sophisticated customers. While Discartec was launched in the middle of the pandemic at the height of the hard lockdown in July 2020 as a no frills inclusion super app with no initial deposit, no maintaining balance, and no dormancy fee, with a high 3.25% annual savings interest, offering micro insurance, micro loans, telemedicine, transfers, and payments, and the radical shift from bricks to clicks. So for this carpet alone, we managed to disrupt the space as the Philippines' first and only Taglish and Cebuano inclusion super app. We believe that language is also a barrier to entry. Endearing one's mobile, sorry, uh, endearing uh, one's mobile app to anyone is key in making it an everyday companion. Apart from that, RCBC also recently pioneered the expansion of acceptable IDs for easier client onboarding and EKYC. From the industry standard of seven acceptable IDs, this carpet now accepts any one of the total 18 IDs. This resolves one of the long-standing pain points for customers when it comes to account registration and verification. Diversifying our service menu under the campaign hashtag Halos Lahat Puede also attracted more users to use the app. We also gave our small business owners an option to earn extra income through the Discartec Pakisuyo services, which allowed our small business partners to charge a minimal service fee for every Pakisuyo service. Lastly, one of the most important buy-ins of the Discartec app is the 3.25%, as I've said, the interest, rate, the interest rate for their savings, which they could earn annually in their digital savings accounts. So these features and services massively contributed in driving up our key performance indicators. In 30 days from launch, we have reached over a million app downloads. To date, this carpet has close to 5 million app downloads. In less than five months, we have a registered user in every province of the country. In less than a year, we have nine out of 10 users who are in the provinces, and 70% are millennials and Gen Z. And as of December 2021, this carpet has also booked a gross transaction value in excess of 18.3 billion. This Cartex partner deposits also recorded a 26,568% and 6,632% surge in transaction value and volume, respectively, with over 8 billion pesos in cash in value. These cash in and deposit transactions are being done in over 45,000 touch points nationwide that include 7 Eleven, Buy It Center, Ayana, rural banks, pawn shops, drug stores, and money service businesses, among others. InstaPay outgoing registered a growth of 12,394% and 1,957% in transaction volume and value, respectively, while InstaPay incoming booked 1,392% and 527%, respectively. While bills payment transactions also made a big jump to 2,616% and 2,113% in volume and value, respectively. 
So with its unique cardless withdrawal feature, ATM Go, the country's first neighborhood mobile point of sale terminal, has become a reliable partner of ordinary Filipinos and MSMEs with over 1,500 terminals deployed in 74 out of 81 provinces in the country. In the past years, RCBC Digital, the bank's premier mobile banking app for the mass affluent, came up with over 20 digital features, including the person-to-merchant QR payments use case, the in-app UITF placement, mobile check deposit, the Philippines' first digital investment management account or EMA opening, digital concierge, among others. By partnering with, RC, with SSS, RCBC Mobile also became a qualified disbursement account for SSS members who need to avail of their benefits via digital platforms. But for us to fully realize a financially inclusive Philippines, we in RCBC and Descartes believe that we have to go beyond the basic services the app offers. Innovation and initiatives are keys to achieve this vision. So RCBC's Descartes has also proven to be a reliable partner of the government in accelerating the disbursements of emergency cash subsidies at a time when our fellow Filipinos need it most. This was also made possible by the network of Ayuda payout partners that Descartes has established. As of December 2021, more than 20.5 billion in government aid has been dispersed, benefiting 6.13 million household beneficiaries, covering about 30.6 million individuals. We also partnered with Hapinoy, the Philippine Association of Source and Scarinderia Owners, and Negotio Center for inclusive programs that will benefit and support our MSMEs, especially now in a time of pandemic. Aside from the Pakisuyo services, we also offer our Sari Sari store insurance package for as low as 35 pesos, plus the massive promotion on the use of QR codes or QRPH for payments. This year, Descartec has also enabled its loan marketplace, a first for a Philippine bank, where users may avail of different loan offerings currently available in the app. This includes agri and crop loans, among other offerings from our various lending partners. Using alternative data for new to credit customers to gain greater access to loan services, Descartec also piloted just this month what we call the Descartec score or DT score. This will allow current Descartec users to grow their credit standing or as they build up on points which they gain by doing specific digital transactions. Strategic partnership is also key for this part as continuous innovation. This year, the team has established partnerships with key government agencies and NGOs to help drive G2X and B2X transactions. As an, as an advocate of open banking, RCBC also pioneered a project that will help smaller financial institutions develop and sustain their own digital initiatives. RCBC Synergy or Synergy in Finance is meant really to enable, empower, and engage our, our rural banks, MFIs, cooperatives, and other small players in the industry to level up and to be part of our massive digitalization efforts in support of the vision of the BSP. The collaboration will not only help the RBAP member banks in setting up their own digital platforms, it is also expected to help push financial inclusion in the countryside, empowering this uh, financial service providers to be digitally enabled, thus leveling the playing field. RCBC and Descartec has also been a strong ally for pushing, pushing digital green finance, which supports Filipino fisher folks, farmers, and other green and sustainable initiatives, especially from the countryside. With the help of Descartec, we were able to develop a digital payments ecosystem that aids the renewable energy initiatives in the island barangays of Cebuto and Sitangkay in Tawitaw. Descartec also partnered with the Department of Education for the implementation of a grassroots financial education program next school year, dubbed as the Aralin Sama Discarding Pananalapi, or Lessons in Resourceful Finance. The program puts a special focus on discussions and classroom activities that explore the concepts of digitalization, inclusive digital finance, and financial technology. The program also aims to promote a deeper understanding of what RCBC has identified as the five pillars of financial inclusion payments, insurance, savings, investment, or loans, or what I call PCL. With all these digital innovations initiatives that RCBC and Descartec have launched for a little more than a year, we also see a need for more far-reaching financial literacy and uh, consumer protection campaigns. We are also supporting the relaunch of the National Strategy for Financial Inclusion of the BSP with its campaign, hashtag Kabilang Ako. Through an effective financial literacy strategy and program, we are not only helping our digital banking customers to maximize the use of services we offer, but we are also empowering them to rise above financial exclusion. Discartec also pioneered Discartec TV or DTTV, the first digital-based broadcast program advocating for financial education in the country. 
aside from live streaming via DTTV, we have also blazed a trail for financial education, digital literacy through Peaceonomics, a Spotify-based podcast on financial literacy. Because of our commitment to our core values, digital initiatives, and efforts to drive financial education and literacy forward, RCBC has reaped uh, multiple, uh, multiple awards and recognitions here and abroad for this year. Uh, this includes our, our back-to-back Asia Money win as the country's best digital bank in 2020 and 2021, among a host of other recognitions. This industry nods and lauds will only encourage RCBC and this Cartec to continue pushing the limits in improving our services to creatively innovate for the empowerment of more Filipinos and to make our best vision of a fully digital Philippines a reality. We in RCBC and Descartec believe that almost everything in digital banking innovation is within reach. Hence our mantra, halos lahat pwede. Above all, it is our desire to accompany our clients and users in their journey in what we call the hashtag Kasama Senso, making, making them partners through generation. And with that, thank you and have a good day. Rami salamat. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, Lito Bidinueva. That was very interesting. It was. I think with one aspect of the conversation so far that you really highlighted in your discussion was that of how technology can really help in terms of um, inclusion, right? Um, and it's you know very very impressive. And I'm actually very familiar in with your with your apps. It's uh, quite interesting to see the, all the development that you're doing in that space. Yeah, actually, uh, so Papa, it's so more of uh, it's more of humanizing technology. That's a good point. That's a good point. I think especially that's important here, I mean, in the Philippines where, uh, I mean, before the pandemic, uh, I don't, don't want to say any numbers, but Alamco, very few Filipinos actually were using, had bank accounts and, and are now being forced to use, uh, because of the pandemic, to digitalize their, their I don't know, financial practices and, and are now adapting and adopting to these sort of uh, services that you and, and our other speakers' banks have, are offering now. So sure. thanks so much, sir. Welcome. Um, uh, our next speaker uh, for this morning uh, uh, is Attorney J.J. Desini. Uh, Attorney Desini is a professor at the University of the Philippines College of Law and is a director of the Law Center's Technology and Policy Program. Uh, he's also the, is currently the managing partner of the Desini and Desini Law Office. And I, I think is, is one of the leading, uh, I would like to add, one of the leading uh, legal minds when it comes to technology policy. Um, so, Attorney JJ, thank you for being here, for joining us again uh, this morning. Uh, I understand you have some slides that you wanted to share. Thank you, uh, Paco, and uh, good morning to everyone. I'd like to thank uh, Stratbase ABR for uh, having me here today. Wait, let me get that. Okay. Um, having, me to, uh, having me here today. Uh, so, I just have a couple of slides in reaction to what has been discussed. Uh, very uh, impressive, uh, of course, presentation by uh, by everyone. I'd like to thank everyone for their contribution. Um, and I, I'd like to start off with what uh, uh, Director Plabasan discussed earlier, which is the open finance framework, which the BSP uh, embodied in a circular that they issued last year. And uh, and I'd like to put that into context uh, in relation to what I believe was the inspiration for that circular, which is uh, the European Union's uh, regulation called PSD2. And I'd like to explain very briefly how, how PSD2 allowed uh, banks uh, and uh, what they call uh, ASPSP, which, uh, which stands for uh, account, service, account Servicing Payment Service Provider. Okay, So if you see PISP, that means uh, Payment Initiation Service Provider. And uh, AISP stands for Account information service provider. And both these uh, APISP and AISP, both uh, these uh, acronyms actually appear in the BSP circular. So just to give you an idea from a, from a user standpoint, what can we expect from uh, open finance if it comes to fruition? Now, the, the area in the pink is the area which is, uh, will be the subject of uh, regulation and uh, the subject matter of the, the circular in terms of uh, the regulated entities. And of course, you have the ASPSPs, which are, uh, in my view, in the Philippines, it will probably be EMIs like uh, Globe, uh, GCash, and banks. Okay, so let's say you have an account information service provider, and this you are the uh, uh, this guy, and you want to know you want to know all of the balances in your account. So you will then sign up with an AISP, 
account information service provider. And then the account in information service provider has uh, access to the APIs, the um, application protocol interfaces provided by the ASPSP and the banks. And then you can see in one screen all of the balances in all of your bank accounts simultaneously provided by the AISP. Okay, so just to be clear, the PISP and the AISP will be are the fintechs, right? And then the, everyone on the left are uh, are account uh, holding uh, entities like banks and ASPSP. Okay, the other service that we will see is payments, right? You can make payments through the services provided by fintechs through the payment initiation service provider. So let's say Ms. Mr. Purple wants to send money to Ms. Orange, he sends, he signs up with the PISP, a fintech, an app, right? And then he sends a message to the PISP that he wants to transfer money to Ms. Purple. I'm uh, sorry, Ms. Orange. So then he sends that and that information goes to the bank. And then what happens here is that the bank sends that money from bank to bank. The critical thing to remember here is that the PISP and AISP, in other words, the fintechs, don't handle any money. All the money transfers from bank to bank. And that's important because this means really that um, what happens effectively is that if you're a bank and you sign up and you, you connect through APIs to the fintechs, all the services that the fintechs offer will then be available to your customers. <clears throat> if you don't sign up with a PISP or ASP, then you are, you are uh, making it, sorry, you're providing less services right, to your customers, as opposed to those who participate uh, within uh, this framework, okay? So, and then the other thing to remember is that, so number one, uh, if you don't join, if you're a bank, I think there's a greater chance you will lose your customers because if you're a customer and you want functionality, then you will move to a bank that will allow you more functionality and services. I think that's one thing to remember. The second thing to remember is that the accounts or the money are not lost to the to the fintechs. Instead, the fintechs, uh, uh, fintechs merely uh, handle information. Also, under PSD two, it's important to say that the personal information handled by the by the fintechs are only used by them only to process the transaction and for no other purpose. So, therefore, personal information is secured within the within the framework. In the in the BSP circular, the open finance uh, framework will be set up by the open Open Finance Oversight um, Committee, which is a uh, made up of the players, the participants. So it's actually an experiment in uh, in uh, in PPP and encouraging OFOC to act as sort of an SRO. And this is an outline of all of the things that uh, OFOC uh, can do. Of course, with the overriding authority of the BSP. So the BSP, in a sense, has has said has encouraged right the the industry to build uh, open finance framework. And I think uh, what's significant here, uh, and uh, dovetailing with the presentation by, uh, by Lito, is that if you take open finance in the Philippines, it, there is a, an opportunity for financial inclusion. Because what you have on the right here are, say, OFWs and, say, a foreign employer from OFW. And open finance has the ability to link them directly with the unbanked people in the, in the edges and merchants in areas, in remote areas, and say schools in remote areas that allows an OFW, for example, to make a direct payment through the open finance framework directly to a school to ensure that the money that OFW earns is made to pay for tuition and not, uh, not used for other purposes. Maybe payments to OFWs can be made directly to groceries to make sure that money sent and earned by OFWs are used for groceries and the necessities of uh, the people whom uh, the OFW intends to receive, rather than it being used for for other things. So these are just this is I think the the goal uh, of uh, of uh, open the open finance framework. The other thing I want to comment on is the the issue raised by by WIC on cybercrime and truly uh, that's a that's a problem uh, with respect to phishing attacks. Uh, suffice it to say that these, uh, these bad actors um, uh, have acted in such a way that it will be difficult for them to, to be caught. What is important is that within the, within the system, within the ecosystem of banks, uh, EMIs, right, and all the, all the intermediaries in the, in the middle, that there is an ability on the part of the customer or the victim to recover, but there are challenges to recovery. 
Number one, uh, there are two laws that, uh, that basically say, this is the National Payment Systems Act, that when a transaction is recorded in the, in the bank, there is, a, there is a finality as to that. Um, and therefore, what that means is that the record is kept by the bank, the transfer is final, but of course it is subject to, to being disputed. And therefore that will then have to be a correct, there will have to be a corrective entry, a correction entry further down, further down the, the road. The, the biggest problem of course is deposit secrecy. The problem, for example, there was a bank in the last phishing incident. There was a bank which, uh, which uh, through which the money went, a lot of the money went. And, uh, and uh, that bank received a lot of uh, flack in the media and was basically blamed. Well, the problem with that bank is that they cannot even respond to the charges because under the Deposit Secrecy Act, it is a crime for a bank to disclose even any information about a bank account. So I'm a user of BPI. And one of the things that I see in the BPI app, if I mobile app, if I move money from one BPI account to another BPI account, I only enter the bank account number. I do not enter the name of the depositor, right? And if it, if, the, if it goes through, then it will go through. The reason for that is BPI does not want you to use the app to confirm the existence or, or the identity of the, uh, the uh, depositor. And that's, and that's because of the Deposit Secrecy Act. So what this means is that because of the Deposit Secrecy Act, it makes it very difficult, if not impossible, for, for claimants to recover from the banks because the banks themselves are constrained. They're not allowed to disclose any information. So I think what needs to happen, is there has to be uh, an alternative dispute resolution method, probably through uh, arbitration, where all participants in these payment systems are allowed to waive their uh, deposit secrecy uh, or their rights to, to the secrecy of their deposits in order for the banks to be able to cooperate. And I think this will make the system stronger and allow banks to, to act um, uh, in, a more, uh, in a more expeditious manner to assist uh, victims in recovering uh, funds that have been. Uh, so arbitration law, I think, is the way to go. Uh, we already have the legal framework. And there's even inspiration from the Philippine Clearing House, which has had an arbitration a process uh, since 19, uh, I believe, 1983. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Attorney JJ. Thanks so much for, for sharing again your insights with us. Um, this reminds me, you were actually one of our, our speakers when we had this this discussion last year. So this, in, in many ways, serves as an update to what's happened in the last year uh, in terms of technology and uh, in, in this sector. Uh, so thank you so much, Pono. Uh, I'm actually going to quickly jump now to our to our open forum. Since we are running a, a bit a bit behind schedule, we do want to uh, cut off, uh, you know, end the whole thing before before eleven o'clock, as as promised. Um, so I'll I'll quickly get into our our open forum, and I hope uh, I think we still have a lot of our speakers here, and I'm hoping that they can can respond to some of the questions that we have. Uh, the first one really is, and I wanted to to go back to a topic that we were discussing earlier. It was discussed earlier, rather. I mean. Some one of our speakers was talking about, you know, having zero trust and how technology, uh, you know, helps in doing that. And zero trust is again a term that we hear when we talk about things like, you know, uh, the blockchain and things like that. <clears throat> and then at the same time, uh, it was also raised in the mind that when it, when we're, when we're talking about frontliners, there is this cultural and social aspect about trust. So I mean, I just wanted to get. Uh, you know, hear from our speakers you know there's this i know our discussion today was a lot about trust and security um and and the role of technology in that and then now we have the role of of this more social and and this these habits that have been created over time and how do you see uh those two dynamics jiving with each other as we move towards this this hybrid future of banking uh any insights on that on technology and 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 that social aspect. Yeah, maybe if I can uh, start, no. Uh, yes, I please. Think, yeah, to, to, uh, to that question, no, Paco. In fact, we have been. Okay, I will, I'll just be wearing my other hat, no. Of course, as you mm -hmm. knows this, uh, as chairman of FinTech Alliance. In fact, we have been quite uh, aggressive uh, in terms of having to support the BSP and other regulators in terms of having to educate the public or the consumers 
uh, as regards you know security you know and having to ensure that you know we keep the trust uh, amongst the consumers uh, especially with uh, you know with the influx of you know uh, cyber you know cyber attacks or cyber threats etc so that's why consumer education has always been at the uh, center no uh, the forefront of all our initiatives no uh, in fact we have been you know we have been discussing this even in the industry uh, specifically for the fintech industry in terms of having to really ensure uh, you know what we call the culture of consumer uh, customer centricity no ensuring that we always have to uh, really invest heavily on you know protecting our assets and making sure that our security is uh, uh you know uh well well calibrated no, to ensure the uh visual consumer protection thank you Silvia. uh yeah yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. i think um uh fostering digitalization and of course instilling trust are should be pursued simultaneously that's why again Aside from our initiatives, let's say to to collaborate with the players in terms of promoting digital products and services, we also need to make sure that that um, these financial service providers are adapting robust uh, security infrastructure. They also embark on public information campaigns, consumer education, uh, uh, security awareness. So again, uh, they are not uh, mutually exclusive because you cannot you cannot force you cannot encourage uh, a client to to use digital channels channels if he doesn't feel safe and secure using this this alternative channel. So again, this should be pursued simultaneously, instilling trust and fostering digitalization. Thank you, sir. Does Does anybody else want to to weigh in, KG or? Yeah, yeah. So uh, thanks, Paco. Um, you know, I think we've covered a little bit of this already. Uh, me, if you indulge me in geeking out for ten seconds, um, sure thing. You know, I think the zero trust is a is a, is our words, right? They're just words. I think the first the first notion of zero trust, at least the way the two ways I think about this. Uh, one, the term came about when people realized that there was no edge to your network anymore. Right, which is uh, earlier you were in a building, that building had a Wi-Fi, you secured the infrastructure, and you were able to do what you thought you could do within that confine. When none of that exists, your network has no perimeter. And so you need to make sure that uh, the people who are let into that sanctum sanctorum are secure. And the best way to do that is you trust nothing. And I'm talking about it from a complete cyber security perspective. And so I think from implementing it, that's one thing. But what does that mean to a consumer? If you ask me, and, and you know, wearing my business hat of, of any bank, today, if you were to, and I think briefly covered by Lito as well, if you tell a customer today that you can absolutely 100% trust what you do through a mobile phone or through a, a website or a browser, that actually becomes differentiation for you as a business model. Right? And so tomorrow's banks and today's digital banks, and we heard about some six of them being approved, um, exist and are evolving largely because A, the trust in this entire model is increasing. But for a traditional bank to be considered as a player in that space, security becomes a differentiator. And instead of shying away from saying my consumer does not understand what that means, we can find ways to simplify that message to say, you can trust what we do through this, this, and this, right? And so I think we need, we also need to evolve how we think about security as a IT only internal thing to what could be potentially a customer differentiation in the market. That's a good point. Thanks for that. Thanks, KG. Uh, I don't know, Mr. Sanchago, did you want to, to weigh in? Yeah, yes, um, since we're in the discussion of trust, um, the presence of uh, social media groups and some, um, if I may say, journalism, sensationalizing journalism, uh, really doesn't help this this trust factor. No, uh, you will see you will see a lot of um, social media groups uh, championing, uh, pretending to be championing the the consumer, right? But in a way, instead of championing this, they're fueling, they're fueling the apprehension and distrust in the 
uh, the security of the financial ecosystem. No, um, an incident, right? An incident. There's no perfect system, right? There will be um, um, failure points. There will be some transactions that will not go through, right? But what do they do? What they do is just claim that this is another hacking incident. Then they will fire it off, put more wood into the fire and say, uh, this bank did this, I happen to have in this bank and so on and so forth, right? And these are not moderated, right? The, administ ad ad the administrator of this group, right? Are just creating this for viewership and, and uh, trending, right? I don't know what's the motivation here, but instead of education, they are sensationalizing uh, typical issues, right? A simple debit did that go through through the network will say it's been hacked, right? And then some of the media people will also take all of this and then create a a, a, a viral trend to, to glorify, right? That they have uncovered something that no one has seen. Right? So all of these things you put together, you have, you have a, a, the public that you're trying to educate and embrace the, the uh, dig digitalization of the economy. You have another group here who's creating all this uncertainty. Right? In of reinforcing that it is secure, uh, we didn't mean this, right? Granted, in the, in the, in the security and the, in the laws are, are, are missing, are still yeah. lacking, but it doesn't help. It doesn't help that there are groups like this who are creating the uncertainty. Yeah, thanks for, for mentioning that, Mr. Shanshago. I think uh, Attorney Desini wants to, to add, add to that. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, that uh, trust the, sort of the other side of trust is reputation. Uh, in other words, the reason you trust someone is because of reputation and whether it's right. And uh, it reminds me of a Japanese, uh, I think it's a Japanese proverb, which says that when I'm shaking your hand, I don't expect you to hit me with your other hand, right? Uh, I once saw a contract uh, for a Japanese company giving a franchise to a Filipino company. It was all of two pages long on a letter. Uh, it was a letter form contained that four or five clauses, I think on double space, it was unbelievable because they figure you have a reputation to protect. I have, I have the thing that I, I, I should trust you. And all of us here, I think on the panel are, are formed the different parts of that trust. Building that reputation means you're willing to comply with the, with the legal regulations. Now, BSP just issued their new regulations and information security and outsourcing. So you're willing to do that. Uh, Lito uh, is the head of the FinTech Alliance. And uh, I know this for a fact that we have, we have a very stringent uh, membership screening rule. So therefore joining a reputable, uh, reputable uh, organization builds your reputation. Um, using the right tools, right? Provided uh, to, to maintain information security is also one of the ways that you do that. And as a, as a banking institution, maintaining your, the trust of your customers means that you're willing to be held accountable right? By putting yourself out there. And when something goes wrong, you're going to help your customers. So I think trust is, a, in a sense, we're all putting up the responsibility uh, to keep that up. And I think if we all play our part, we should be able to know who are the trustworthy ones and who are not. And uh, uh, taking from what Noel said, yes, there are bad actors out there, but I think there's enough collaboration within those who want to uh, play in this, uh, in this field uh, uh, fairly. Uh, to to keep the bad actors out, to keep them at bay. Thank you. Actually, just to add to what uh, Tony JJ said, no, um, it, it's really true, no. Uh, no, we're our stringent uh, onboarding for uh, new members uh, is well established to the fact uh, to the point that some of our some of those who are applying for membership for Pentec Alliance would uh, would make some remarks saying that it seems that we are also another BSP. In terms of having to vet their their documentation, etc. In fact, just to let you know, because we we really value trust as a you know as a uh, as a as a major you know component in all that in, in our business, 
we actually have to expel one member because of their uh, because of a you know of a decision uh, also coming from the national privacy commission of gross violation of the data privacy law no? so we had to because we are the first um, entity in the Philippines right now that adopted what we call the code of ethics and code of conduct. And now we have the third code, which is the code of consumer centricity. So what we are, in fact, our vision has always been to become an SRO or a self-regulating organization where we actually have to police our set, police the ranks though. Because of course, even SEC admitted that, of course, with, a, you know, with, all, with all these digital players coming into play borderless and, and, and some of them or most of them are not even registered in the Philippines. Uh, are actually doing business uh, in, you know, and trying to lure Filipinos, especially for online lending, for example. And we have quite, we have done quite a number of initiatives to help uh, the SEC, for example, in having to cur to have to uh, having to address that that pain point. No, so that's why I think uh, as a, as an industry player, as a private sector uh, entity, we are really a, a pillar. In terms of having to support our regulators in creating that 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 environment of trust among our consumers. So thanks so much, um, Sir Bilen and Attorney JJ. Um, you know, I I have a list of questions here, but in the interest of time, uh, can I just give? I wanted to give all of the speakers maybe just one more chance, a minute each, perhaps, to share like some final thoughts they had. Uh, that they want to share with with uh, with our participants today. We've been discussing a lot, you know, on on trust and security, and and, and now uh, having the technology side on the banks uh, that allow them to to build this infrastructure, and then at the same time, education for consumers at the end, and then of course in the middle, uh, empowering that, uh, ensuring that our frontliners have you know are adequate adequately equipped to to be the bridge between these two things. And I just wanted to hear if you had any other thoughts on, on this dynamic that we're seeing happening in this new hybrid hybrid industry. Maybe we could go with, uh, in the order that I see it on my screen, uh, Mr. Plabasan first. Did you have any last thoughts that you wanted to share, Pop? Director Plabasan? Yeah. yeah, sorry, Paco. <laughs> any, anyway, can you hear me? I can anyway, hear you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I would just like to reiterate that uh, again, uh, there is this. We, we follow this what we call collective creative approach. So it's not just the BSP. We 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 definitely would like to work with um, other government agencies, the private sector, in, in order for us to really to, to achieve this vibrant uh, digital finance ecosystem. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Um, what about, okay, next I have KG. KG, is there anything that you wanted to? Yeah, to weigh thanks, Paco. Uh, great, great answer so far. I, I uh, you know, shifting away from tools and technology and trust and security, I think uh, the inclusion component is, uh, I, I want to go back to that. And uh, to me, largely because um, let's not forget that the inclusion can really be a cultural catalyst. And in the context of frontline workers who you may not have included, I'm obviously speaking to, to our attendees, if you've not thought about including them, um, think about them and not just as a cost, but as I said, as a cultural catalyst, right? And I think that can go a long way in helping your end customers have a, a really good, rich experience where uh, they might not need to come into a branch and bang the table, as we said, you know, in one of the earlier examples. So uh, please make sure you keep that at the top of your minds. Thanks, KG. Uh, Mr. Noel Santiago, any last uh, thoughts for our speaker, uh, for our uh, for your fellow panelists and our participants? Yeah, I'm I'm very uh, I'm I'm very glad that uh, we have seen here uh, from my peers, from the legal profession, the technology side, and even the regulators that we have a a common uh, a common direction, and uh, everybody is doing their part. Uh, to make a difference. Uh, and we just have to work on this together. And uh, we don't need another pandemic to, to make it work, right? We just, we, we crank the engine and now it's running and we will see an accelerated adoption soon. Thanks, Mr. Santiago. Yeah, 
we don't need another pandemic because we're still very much in the middle of the of the same one. Um, Mr. Lito Villanueva. Yes, thank you, Paco, and thank you to uh, the organizers no, for having us here. I think there's only one thing that I would like to uh, maybe as a, a key takeaway. I think we have seen uh, how resilient Filipinos are, uh, and you know, no matter how serious uh, uh, the crisis is, and uh, we were, were able to you know to uh, to thrive and survive uh, any any calamity, may it be man-made or natural crisis. So I think what is also uh, you know, noteworthy to highlight here is the fact that we are, of course, we are very much grateful to our regulators, not because Mel is here. We thank the BSP uh, for being so aggressive, progressive, dynamic in terms of having to come up with an enabling regulatory framework that would allow innovations to thrive in the, the uh, in the digital landscape, you know, in the digital digital space in the Philippines. And we are very proud that Philippines has been uh, one of the leaders, if not the leader, in so far as having a very dynamic regulatory framework, pushing for massive digitalization for the unbanked and underserved Philippines. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And last but not least, uh, Attorney JJ, your thoughts, Paul. Oh, you're you're on mute though, sir. <laughs> Thank you. It so happens. By, uh, yeah, I know. Thanks. Sorry about that. So, um, uh, as mentioned by by my uh, fellow co-panelists and speakers, uh, we are part of an ecosystem. Everybody's doing their part, and everyone is uh, working uh, independently, but in a sort of uh, collaborative way and co coordinating. Right in this, it's sort of mysterious, but it all sort of this uh, an an emergent uh, order comes uh, from all of this chaos. Uh, but I think what's important to, to point out today is the importance of this venue of dialogue between the different parts. And I'm thankful for, for uh, ADR Stratbase for putting this together because I think the, the uh, exchange of information from the different uh, participants is, is very important uh, so that we are, uh, so that we can keep in touch and make sure that everyone is moving in the in the in the same direction so i'd like to, to thank you for providing this platform and the opportunity for this dialogue okay yeah thank you attorney jj again you know so thank you to all of our speakers uh I, we're now closing the the open forum portion of our of our discussion i think uh you know beginning with the uh, director sorry paco just um, one hold on hold on yes, uh, i almost please, forgot please. i mean uh, Go ahead. Uh, uh, of course, we've been talking about all these digital innovations, uh, you know, inter payments, interoperability, etc. Uh, I just would like to, you know, to to say that, you know, uh, we are also remembering the what I consider the father of uh, inclusive digital finance in the Philippines, uh, the late Governor Nesting Espinilla, who's uh, actually third year na ngayon uh, when he when he passed. So uh, we are very thankful, and as an industry. Uh, to the late Governor Nesting Espinilla, uh, which uh, we are commemorating his third death anniversary today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for reminding us of that, uh, Mr. Villanueva. Um, so on that note, really, uh, I think there's, uh, again, a lot to be thankful for, for the, the, for the, the policymakers that have come ahead of us and, and have laid the ground for, for uh, the developments that we're seeing today. At the same time, I'd like to thank our speakers uh, Mr. Mel Pabasan, uh, KG Gopal, uh, Mr. Noel Santiago, and Mr. Lito Villanueva, and Tony JJ Vecini, as well as uh, Mr. Wicks uh, Veloso, who joined us, uh, as mentioned through a video earlier. It was great to have everybody here together. Uh, indeed, I think the, I think uh, by asking everybody to share their last, uh, their last key takeaways, it saved me from having to prepare any sort of closing remarks substantial closing remarks. So I thank everybody also for that. Uh, it was great to have, again, like you said, to reiterate, have all of these stakeholders from the regulatory side, from the back side, from, from the technology sector, and from academia to come together and to really discuss all of these important issues um, uh, that we're seeing now and all of the important developments that we're seeing. And especially, we're not just discussing any more um, about adapting to the pandemic, but actually moving forward into this new era of, of hybrid ranking that we've been discussing. Uh, and of course, to emphasize again, the, the importance of this security, uh, trust and inclusion in, in this future vision that we have for, for the country and for the sector. 
so with that, again, I would like to thank all of our speakers, our panelists, and the over 100 unique uh, participants that joined us this morning. Uh, we will be sharing uh, a recording of this uh, discussion through our Facebook page, Stratface ADRI Institute on Facebook and on YouTube, and, uh, and uh, you can catch it all there. Um, so thank you again to everybody, and I wish everybody uh, a good rest of their day. So thanks so much, and let's not wait for another year to have this again. All right, thank you. Have a long weekend. <laughs> yeah, bye yeah, bye. that's true. Have a thank good you. Long weekend. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for coming. Thank you, everybody.